Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bobby Rains. I'm here for our once every three weeks uh, Investors Observer Members Only Workshop. We probably should come up with a snappy term for once every three weeks, tri-weekly or something like that. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. We have pretty much our usual agenda here. What's going on in Investors Observer um, is we're working on some exciting new things that we hope to push out to you later in the spring, let's call it. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah. And then, so today's presentation will follow the format that we usually use, which is some discussion of what's going on in the market. And then the rest is member driven content, questions, site demonstrations. Um, I got a bunch of questions ahead of time. So thank you for those. Um, and then any other questions you have that you would like to like answered during the presentation, by all means, uh, put them in the question box there and we'll get to as many of them as possible. All right. Uh, and yeah, as always, you know, if you send things in ahead of time, mention the workshop and I'll try to put some slides together. All right. So we're going to start here. This is the S&P 500, uh, two years worth of daily candles. Let's see. All right. Um, mostly I wanted to bring this up to show that we sort of retested the 50 day moving average and got rejected uh, late last week. Um, and the reason that's interesting is you can see previous points where we have tested the 50 day moving average. Um, you kind of want to get back above that pretty quickly. Um, Right, there's a test here that failed. And then you have this decline and a retest here that failed. And here. And then this one we came back out of pretty quickly. Um, so that's what you'd like to see is to get back over that hump relatively quickly. The, the more times you hit a line and, and fail, usually the, obviously the longer it takes to get back above it. Me just a second here. All right. Um, moving to the next slide. Yeah, so this is six months. I just really just wanted to kind of zoom in a little bit and show both the retest here and then also the um, yeah, get a better look at this retest of the 50 day moving average. And then as the 200 day gets closer to the 100 day, you sort of prefer your longer moving averages to be, um, or sorry, you prefer the 100 to be above the 200. So as the 100 comes down, you, you know, you'd really like for that not to happen. It seems kind of inevitable at this point, um, but you, you know, hope it doesn't stay that way for too long in any case. All right, next slide. So this is a fun chart that I've pulled out a couple times in blog posts and other places. This is 20 years and each candle is a month. Um, so what we have here is we have this top line is sort of the bottom of the channel from the, we'll call it the, the pre-Great Financial Crisis rally. Um, you can see we hit that once or twice and then broke through it here in the last couple of months. Um, you know, late last year. And then uh, this is, you know, sort of the, the bottom of the channel is some lows from the post great, great financial crisis rally. Um, and we do, we did get all the way below that. Um, we hit the 100 month moving average for what that's worth. Uh, you know, at some point with this wick here in um, a month ago candle, uh, we're kind of back in the middle of that now. So, I'm not sure exactly what that means. I'm not a CMT, um, but it. I, I would hope that we can stay in this channel at least. So while 
yeah. While I would have liked to have seen us break through the 50-day moving average, I, I have some some good feelings about us at least staying sort of above this right now 2,400 level. Um, we're well above that now, but I think if we start to go back over again, we should that line could serve as some uh, some support. All right. So what else is going on? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, uncertainty is everywhere. No one really knows how long this is going to last, right? The various state by state uh, social distancing and other sort of restrictions. Um, nobody knows how those are going to be in place. Some states are starting to reopen, but even then, uh, you know, we have some questions about sort of what does that mean? Um, Polling suggests the idea of reopening isn't very popular right now. Um, and then also White House guidelines, even in phase three advise that like large venues, which they mentioned like movie theaters, things like that, um, operate under some physical distancing guidelines, which implies not operating at full capacity. Um, and so what I really think you have to look at here in terms of what does reopening mean with regard to getting back to normal um, is, you know, at what point are people going to want to sit next to a stranger in a movie theater or share an armrest on an airplane? Um, that That's, I think, when you really start to get back to normal. We're going to be below the previous level of economic activity until we get to that point. Um, and I think that's going to take a while. They can they can announce everything is open tomorrow, and I don't think we're going to be back anywhere close to normal levels of, of economic activity. Um, and you can see this a little bit in uh, in what I'm calling the Swedish model, where they you know banned mass gatherings, uh, but most businesses are allowed to be open. Schools are open, gyms are open, all that stuff is open. Um, they did put in some distancing guidelines. They tried to keep down on like crowded nightclub kind of thing. Um, so they do have some distancing guidelines, but yeah, data from Google shows like a 41% drop in retail and recreation activity. It's even like 15% in terms of like grocery stores and pharmacy visits, I think in Sweden. And a lot of the movie theaters are shuttered. Um, they just closed up because they, you know, they, they did put in some, you know, again, spacing guidelines for movie theaters, but they're allowed to be open and people just aren't going because um, again right like nobody wants to share a, mo a crowded movie theater with strangers uh with this virus thing going on all right now earnings has also started uh they're down pretty significantly from last year um which is not surprising more than 10 percent i think on the you know basis of what has been reported so far. Uh, the beat rate is also lower, even though a lot of the estimates were revised downward. Um, and we're not seeing a lot of companies issuing guidance, which really sort of, you know, just to reinforce the point of nobody really seems to know how long this is going to go on and how can you make, yeah, how can you make forecasts when you don't know when people are going to be allowed to do things again or when they're going to want to do things again? Um, that gets real tricky. So earnings reported so far this year, combined with estimates for the rest of the year, point to a, a drop of 14.8% for the year. Um, meanwhile, the aggregate PE ratio for the S&P 500 is something like 18.5%, which is already higher than the you know five and 10 year averages, which were pre-virus. Um, so this means that expectations of growth for the years after this year are even higher now than they were pre-crisis. Now, it's reasonable to assume that on some level, we will get some growth due to pent-up demand from delayed purchases, right? Uh, anybody who's not buying a car or refrigerator or, you know, those sorts of things, televisions, those sorts of things that people aren't buying right now, they probably will buy uh, when things reopen and we're allowed to go out again. Um, but a lot of things won't get bought either, right? Like nobody's going to eat 14 restaurant meals a week instead of seven. Um, I mean, maybe in that first week, but it seems unlikely that that's sustainable in the sense of like actually making up for all the lost meals. And the same is true for movie tickets and vacations, you know, business travel, all sorts of things like that. Um, those things aren't going to happen uh, at the same level. Um, 
Delta said today on their earnings call, I think, that uh, they're expecting air travel to normalize over the next two or three years. Um, and that honestly seems pretty reasonable to me. Um, between, yeah, between people not wanting to do things and then the lingering economic effects of, you know, people being worried about the economy, so they take fewer vacations, not really sure what the business travel situation looks like going forward in terms of, oh, hey, people discover they can do all these online meetings, so they need to travel quite so much. Um, it's hard to tell. Um, so I think it might be two or three years, and then we find what may be a new normal. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what that looks like. And then, yeah, there's additional drag sort of coming to the economy, right? We know about the, you know, big unemployment claims. Um, I think the biggest numbers there, we've we've probably seen the biggest numbers there in terms of new unemployment claims in a week. Um, 22 million claims in like three weeks. Um, right, so we can still get big numbers. It's just not going to be... Uh, quite so shocking um but there is some additional drag coming as states and localities move into the next fiscal year um right like people not yeah if your income right income taxes and sales taxes are both going to be a lot lower and unlike the federal government states can't run a fiscal deficit um which means job losses basically right that's you know cops teachers firefighters anybody who works for a state and local government is potentially looking at some kind of cutback there um so you know you'd like to see the federal government or someone step in and provide funding to keep those people in place because right losing those good jobs is um you know bad for the economy, um, maybe worse for the economy than losing the, uh, you know, some of the lower paid service industry jobs. Um, they certainly tend to come back slower. Uh, you know, we saw after the, the last recession, the service service industry hiring picked up a lot faster than some of the um, state and, uh, and, and local hiring. So we'd like to see those jobs not get lost as opposed to get lost and then have to be, uh, be recovered. All right, and then, yeah, oil prices were negative earlier this week, um, kind of. Um, so let's talk about that for a minute because it's interesting. Um, and I think a lot of people aren't 100% sure what that means. So they sort of went negative. What actually went negative was the price for what's called the front month oil futures contract, which front month is just a fancy way of saying the next one to expire. Right, so typically there's the front month, which is the next one, the back month, which is the one after that, and then there's there's other ones that are past the back month too. But yeah, front month and back month are basically the next two, um, and those are the ones where there's the most the most liquidity and the most trading going on. Um, there's not a lot of spot trading in oil. Spot trading is essentially the like, hey, do you want to buy this today kind of thing. Um, oil is a complicated product. There's a lot of logistics involved, so. There's not a whole lot of people who are like, you know, walking around with a bucket full of oil looking to unload it at a given time. Um, so most of the trading is in futures. And so, yeah, that May delivery contract expired April 21st, which was yesterday. So Monday, uh, a whole bunch of people had oil futures and they didn't want them anymore because if you long a futures contract, uh, when it expires, you have to take delivery of something like a thousand barrels of oil per contract. Um, and yeah, most people who are trading oil futures aren't actually interested in becoming the owner of a thousand barrels of oil. Um, and I think a lot of people had bought oil futures because the price went down really far, uh, pretty fast, and they were expecting a bounce. And then when that bounce didn't come, people had to get out. And most of the time, what you do to get out is you sell the front month and you buy the back month, right? So people would be selling May and buying June. <clears throat> but, and yeah, like I said, that trade got crowded with people expecting a bounce in oil prices. And you have a lot of overhang in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, um, Oil is a transportation fuel, no one's moving, fewer goods are moving, and pretty much the entire supply chain is full, right? Like gas stations are selling less, refineries are refining less. It goes 
all the way back up the chain to these oil storage, right? The the hubs and storage facilities where these contracts um, are required to get delivered. Um, so what happens is futures holders who can't or don't want to take delivery have to get out. Um, and at a certain point, if you're looking at suddenly becoming the owner of a thousand barrels of oil and have no idea where to store it, and by the way, storage also responds to supply and demand when there's, yeah. guess what? If I'm storing oil in Oklahoma right now, I can name my price. Um, so if you're looking right at suddenly becoming the owner of a thousand barrels of oil and you don't know or even understand how to arrange storage for that on the short term, it honestly makes economic sense to pay someone to just take the out, the contract off your hands as opposed to trying to arrange all of those particulars and then try to sell actual barrels of oil somewhere. Um, so, right, no one was giving away free oil. People were giving away oils, futures contracts, which, right, it, it, it works out to some people probably got paid to take oil futures contracts and now they own oil that they got paid to take. Um, but it's it's a weird, yeah, it's a weird thing that has to do with that futures contract expiring much more than um, sort of demand for oil being less. And you only really see this with things like oil because um, we've seen in the milk market, um, farmers can just dump milk. Uh, we're looking at probably a big hog cull. Um, in terms of, you know, there are hog futures and some of the meat packing plants are closing now because they've had uh, COVID-19 outbreaks, but hog farmers can just kill hogs and bury them and that's the end of it. Um, you can't just dump your oil out or put it in a hole in the ground. Um, ideally, you would not get it out of the ground, but capping a well has its own um, its own problems. And so that's, that's why oil futures can trade negative and almost nothing else really ever does because it just makes sense to not sell it as opposed to pay somebody to take it, except for in this case where you can't dump it out and you don't want to hold it. So you got to pay somebody to take it away. Um, all right, on to the question and answer. Uh, we have a question from Jason who said he invested in oil, um, WTI, MR, SM. He felt those companies would come back uh, sports with outdoor media is, I think, the, that company. Um, and then some infrastructure stimulus he's expecting um, with CLF, USCR, FLR, and then also invested in Hertz. Um, so when I look at this list of tickers, these are all pretty speculative plays. Um, onshore oil is pretty highly leveraged, right? All those companies carry a lot of debt. Um, one of the reasons they're still pumping, in addition to issues with um you know capping wells is regardless of how profitable they are they have bond payments to make right you got to make those bond coupons or you don't own an oil well anymore um so selling oil at a loss as long as it brings some cash in so you can do something like that um so that's one of the reasons that's still happening. So we'll see what happens there. I expect some of those companies will go out of business. I, I mean, eventually the price of oil will go back up. It's not going to trade at 15 bucks forever. Um, but I don't know when that's going to happen. And it's really a question of how long can it stay low and who can keep making bond payments. Uh, CLF, USCR, and FLR is an interesting grouping just because CLF is a, a pure commodity price play, right? They do coal and iron ingots basically it's raw materials for steel um so i get where that plays into infrastructure um but it's not an infrastructure play in the same way that flr is flr is a right construction engineering company that's that's a bet on an infrastructure package somebody's going to get hired to build a highway and it's probably going to be like floor or one of three or four other companies most of the time they're there aren't too many that can take on like interstate highway level uh, infrastructure projects. And then USCR is concrete. They're a little bit in the middle. Um, it's not entirely commodities, but they're not actually making a, you know, they're not actually directly the contractor on a, on a construction project either. Um, but yeah, I, I really would caution you that those are, yeah, the difference between cliffs and FLR is pretty different in terms of what the economic exposures there are. Um, 
and then Hertz, yeah, the, the price is way down from where it was. Um, but you look at things like they have bonds due in 2022 that are trading at a 50% yield to maturity, um, which honestly may be a better investment than the stock. I, yeah, um, either of those is a real risky bet. Uh, bonds trading at a 50% yield to maturity is a, uh, that's a, yeah, that's the bond market telling you this is a very risky credit. Um, and yeah, if the, yeah, guess what happens if they don't make the bond payments? The uh, the bondholders become the stockholders, and the stockholders get wiped out. So um, yeah, those are all of those are pretty risky. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of long investments, they may they may work out, but that's a uh, yeah, that's a that's a pretty risky basket of of things you've assembled there. All right, what do I think of the current valuation of Shopify? So let's look at the website um, here. All right, so Shopify, it turns out, does not earn money. Um, they're still losing money and so yeah, companies that lose money pretty much defy all of the normal valuation models, which are like oh, discounted, right? Like, you know, the net present value of future cash flows. Um, we don't know what the future cash flows are because uh, right now there there are none. Um, I don't really know when there are going to be some. And then some other stats about Shopify because I am aware of Shopify. It's not a stock I follow closely. Um, but yeah, so it has a market cap that puts it somewhere between Lowe's and Boeing, um, which those are big name stocks that everybody knows. Uh, Boeing's obviously had some troubles recently, but fundamentally there is a business there. Um, and uh, yeah, the, so Shopify has a market cap that's greater than Lowe's on something like 2% of Lowe's revenue. Um, and yeah, theoretically doing online transaction processing is a higher margin business than physical retail like Lowe's, but Shopify needs to actually, you know, actually turn on the profit at some point. Um, Amazon did a similar thing for years where they sort of ran losses and then, and grew super fast and then they turned the profit switch on and it worked. Um, and Shopify isn't, I don't believe, is going to have to build warehouses and a bunch of the other things. Um, so it may work out, um, but I, yeah, I see a stock that's gone from 100%, from 100 bucks to more than 600 bucks in less than two years and doesn't actually earn any money and it makes me nervous. Um, not to say it might not still go up from here, but. Yeah, I would have felt a lot better about it uh, at a hundred bucks than I do at six hundred. All right, let's go back to the slides here. Yeah, okay, so that stuff. All right, so we got a couple of questions from Garth uh, about the website. Um, so one, I'm sure unsure of how to access the trade idea generator. Um, and he's presuming it's available to lead subscribers. It is. Uh, trade idea generator is a name we don't use anymore. Um, but what it refers to is our options trade screener, which can be found under options and then options screener. Uh, we've got seven strategies that you can search from. Um, and then let me get back to a couple of Garth's other questions here because they were related. Is there an easier way to find a specific company among those listed? Easier than say scrolling through the alphabet to reach Merck? Um, probably the easiest way if you're looking for a specific company is put it in the ticker box here. Um, and that'll take you to the page that has our stock analysis, our options trades, and also recent news from Merck, um, all on one page. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to do that. And then let's see. Uh, 
filter for specific stocks would indicate a best covered call for any stock. So yeah, again, that is, it seems like the option screener, um, right? Obviously, if you're looking for Merck, we have that covered call there. And what we do is, right, we find the best trade for each of the, um, you know, the best trade in each of those strategies that we can find. Uh, and we put it on the stock page. And then obviously, you know, if you go and search for covered calls, this is the best covered call we think for Agilent today, et cetera. Um, so those are right there. And then finally, is IO still the entity that provides best option strategies for subscribing brokerages like Fidelity? Um, so we have relationships with Argus Research and CFRA Research. Um, CFRA Research is the, it's mostly the same equity research team that used to be uh, the S&P equity research. Um, CFRA bought that piece of the S&P business a couple years ago. And so we provide options, you know, an options piece on top of that, uh, of their equity research. Um, and then that does get sold to, it's on the platform at Fidelity, it's at TD. Um, believe E-Trade came online recently. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do have things on a couple of different brokerages there. Uh, there is a difference in the sense that, you know, Investors Observer has more option strategies available. Um, and that research, yeah, so those option products are based on either Argus's or uh, CFRA's um, equity research as opposed, to, uh, as opposed to our stock scoring system. Um, but yes, we do provide that. Uh, we do provide that, and they are still on the major brokerage sites. All right, those are the pre-prepared questions. Let's see what else we got here. All right, so we have a question from. Well, let's see. I'm not going to attempt that name. Um, what do you mean we write in an email about contracts initiated from the buy side? So I think this is a reference to some of our investors' keyhole trades, specifically the unusual options activity. Yeah, so like this, pricing on today's contracts has been high in the spread, indicating that these contracts are being initiated from the buy side. So every trade has a buyer and a seller, right? That's how trades work. There's somebody on each side. Um, but in options in particular, a lot of times you're trading with a market maker and not with another sort of individual market participant. And so what that means is when you go to sell an option, a lot of times you're selling it pretty close to the bid. If you're buying an option, you're selling it pretty close to the ask. And the spreads, especially in percentage terms, tend to be wider in options than they are um, in stocks. And so if you see a big trade like this one described here, um, or a lot of contracts moving, and they're all high or low in the spread, typically what that means is you're looking at a lot of trades that are being, right, the person coming to market with the trade is a buyer and then a market maker is, you know, is filling that at, you know, at some price that is less than the, uh, less than the current ask, but it's still, you know, high in the spread there. Um, so that's what that means. All right, so I have another question from Jason about, let's see here. I feel the use of CBD will increase over the next two years and wanted to know who should we invest in, suppliers or the seller? Um, who do we recommend? Any mentions? Tilray, YCBD, and IIPR. Um, Jason, I, this is not a question I can answer. Um, 
I don't necessarily disagree about the use of CBD, but the regulatory environment in the U.S. makes it very difficult to pick a stock. Um, there are some number of U.S. CBD suppliers that aren't publicly traded because of, yeah, because of the weird legal framework in the United States that makes cannabis illegal at the federal level, but, you know, becoming increasingly decriminalized or fully legal, legalized at the state level. Um, you know, the publicly traded, yeah, the stocks of companies that you can buy in the United States um, are mostly not dealing with products in the United States. Um, so that, yeah, that makes it a, a tricky investment um, as far as a, a thing to pick out. Um, and generally my feeling is some of those little companies, especially the ones that have fallen a whole lot and, and given that fundamentally we're talking about an agri agricultural product, like I wouldn't be super surprised to see a, you know, a Philip Morris or a Coca-Cola or I guess Constellation Brands actually already owns a chunk of, I think it's CGC. Um, I would expect the big guys to get involved there and either buy up the little guys or just start their own operation and kind of stomp those little guys um, is really more how I expect that to go, but we'll see. Um, and certainly buying a small company and having it get bought, you can, you can make some money. Nobody's going to buy it at the market price today. It'll be at a higher price. Um, so it's not to say you can't, you can't make money on that trade. It's just, I don't know that we're going to see, you know, I don't know that one of these little pot companies now is going to be the Philip Morris of tomorrow. I kind of think Philip Morris might be the Philip Morris of tomorrow just because they have a lot of cash um, and can scale a business like that quickly. So yeah, Akram says, we did not post new trades in the last month. Um, that's correct. The portfolio services have been quiet. We've been trying to manage what we have. Um, you know, we've had a couple things recover. Uh, we took we took a big loss on Dix. Um, but yeah, we really haven't felt like we had a handle on the market in either direction. Um, as earnings come out, we'll start to look at some things and we, we should be putting some trades out in the next couple of weeks based on sort of earnings results and what we expect, uh, how we expect things to trade after that. Um, but it didn't really seem prudent to go uh, particularly bullish or particularly bearish given how fast the market fell and then how fast it bounced. Um, there was a very real possibility all of our longs could have gone bad and then we'd pile into shorts and all those would get killed as well, which we really wanted to avoid. Um, and so, yeah, if, if you're not sure what trade to make, the best answer is is usually don't make any trades until you feel like you have a good idea of what's going on. So that's pretty much where we are. Um, so Eric says, when municipalities looking like they'll be hit harder than federal levels, will this have a def detrimental effect on muni bonds? It's certainly possible. Um, I think the Fed is buying some munis, um, which will certainly help support prices in the short term. Um, Obviously, if you're an actual holder of bonds, though, and the issuer becomes insolvent, you could have a problem. Um, that's, yeah, it's certainly entirely possible that something like that will happen. I don't, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I'm not a credit rating, ag rating, rating agency. Uh, Investors Observer is not a credit rating agency. Um, so that's who I would look at as far as, as far as that goes, is watch the, uh, watch the upgrades and downgrades as far as that goes. Um, but yeah, I, I do think some, some minimum defaults are probably not out of the question. All right, hang on a second here. So Marty says, how do you feel about utility dividends? Do you think they're safe from being cut? Um, I guess it depends, Marty. Um, I think they're among the safer dividends, uh, but again, it depends on the utility. Um, AT&T has a lot of leverage um, and a lot of sort of non-utility pieces in terms of media assets they've bought in the last couple of years that, yeah, advertising budgets are getting cut. So 
if, if you consider AT&T a utility company still, I think that dividend may be less safe than some, you know, Dominion or something like that. Um, but I, yeah, I think I, I think mostly it depends on the utility there. Um, I think your electricity and water, again, if we have a major recession, um, those start to look worse. But I think as dividends go, those are among the safer dividends probably right now just because, yeah. Guess what? I'm all day. Uh, yeah, I'm home all day drinking water, you know, with the lights on. Um, our office is closed, but yeah, the lights are on at my house now during the day instead of at my office. So I don't. I have a hard time knowing exactly what that does to electricity usage. Um, but my guess is those dividends are, on the whole, probably safer. Whereas you know, like I said, AT and T and some of those other ones, but. If we have a you know serious global recession, um, which I see we have another question about there, um, yeah, I think I think those start to look a little bit riskier, but I think those are probably among your safer dividends. Um, and yeah, I don't know if we're going to have a global recession. Honestly, I think it depends on how long some of these right now, how long how long people want to stay home and not go out and spend money. Um, you know, I said my whole thing earlier about reopening and what that means, but really government orders are not what it's going to take to not have a recession is people wanting to go out um and be in crowds and spend money again and that is a much harder thing to answer than you know when do i think you'll be allowed to go to the gym um allowed to go to the gym could be in a couple months when are you going to want to go to the gym i'm not sure um so let's see here. I've invested in multiple marijuana companies and all of these stocks are down. Could you explain what is going on with that? Um, I mean, in short, sort of the marijuana stocks came online and they were hot. Everybody saw it as a growth industry and they ran up super fast and got to be overvalued and then came back to earth because they didn't grow at a rate that made those valuations make any sense. Um, that's essentially what happened there. Um, I mean, we've you know seen the same thing with you know fracking companies ran up too high a few years ago. Rare earth metals in 2010, 2011, something like that. Um, it's a thing that happens from time to time. A hot new thing comes online, and everybody's like, "Oh, this is the future," and they buy it. And some country, some companies get uh, yeah, they get crazy high valuations, and then they come back down. I mean, we saw it with sort of the the second wave of social media companies here. Snapchat, I think, is still underwater. Um, some of those other stocks like that are, yeah, they, they IPO'd because they saw you know, Facebook get a massive valuation and keep going up. And then the second wave came out and just didn't do as well. Um, that seems to be mostly it. So Alan says, do I have a stance on gold or GLD, which is the physical gold ETF? The market still seems so high considering earnings. Gold seems to be more stable, but maybe I should wait for another downfall. Um, so I, yeah, gold doesn't actually report earnings, um, right? I, I assume actually what you mean is the stock market still seems high considering the way earnings are coming out. Um, and I kind of think that's true too. Um, my issue with gold is I don't, yeah, the crisis where gold becomes valuable um, is a crisis where dollars are suddenly worthless. Um, and I don't think this is that crisis. Um, the, the price of gold is very hard to predict because there are a lot of people with, <sighs> Uh, what's the best way to say this? There are a lot of people that have a very a lot of very strong opinions about gold and what it means, and some intrinsic ideas about the definition of moneyness. Let's say, um, and then there are some other people who don't believe that at all. And so, gold trades based on the strength of people's convictions about some things that are very hard for me to model. Um, all right, stocks. You know, you can look at earnings. You can do things like that. It makes sense. Um, 
gold goes up and down based on things like how scared people are about some other stuff and how many people think it's money. And there's some some relatively small, uh, you know, price. I mean, if you look at platinum or silver, um, platinum is rarer than gold, but trades for a lower price. And the reason for that is most people who are, yeah, a lot of the people at least who are buying gold are buying it as some sort of inflation hedge or money substitute as opposed for for jewelry or some industrial use. Um, whereas silver and platinum buyers don't have quite the same motivations and that's why gold trades at a premium to those. Um, so, yeah, if you can figure out a way to trade gold, that's fine, but I don't, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily a good investment other than, like I said, if you're betting that there's a crisis coming where the dollar suddenly becomes worthless. Um, and if I look around the world right now, I see people flooding into dollars. So I don't really think this is that crisis. Marty says, do you think most of the bank stock prices reflect the expected C-19 impact? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the bank earnings that came out last week weren't particularly great. Um, Again, it really sort of depends on how long we have this, you know, sort of slowdown of economic activity. Um, I don't think bank prices currently reflect a like years long recession, um, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that a years long recession is coming either. I think it's a potential outcome, um, but I don't I don't know that it's coming. Um, I don't know that it's not coming either. That was the thing. So, yeah, again, I, it's really hard to make guesses beyond the next couple of weeks at this point because, yeah, because who knows? Um, all right, Greta, how does owning stock in USO, which is a oil ETF, have to do with what I explained about futures contracts. Um, so USO is an ETF. It does not own physical oil. Um, unlike the GLD, it uh, owns futures contracts. So yes, probably part of the reason oil futures went negative was people who didn't want to buy futures bought the USO ETF, um, which led to a big roll, which is when, again, right, you sell that front month to buy the back month to move your, uh, you know, essentially move the date you have to own oil out a bit. Um, that's what that is about. Um, and yeah, USO certainly contributed to that. Uh, that's an ETF that I don't know the future of. Um, it's not leveraged, so it doesn't have some of the problems that we've seen with ETFs that blew up in the past. Um, but they've gone, yeah, they've pretty much changed the rules of the game three or four times this week and a couple of times during market hours. Um, like traditionally they have held the front month future and then rolled it at a given date. Um, and now they've got, I think they've declared they have June's, July's and August futures in some uncertain mix that they're not really going to tell you about. Um, yeah, they certainly contributed to the oil price volatility. Uh, but yeah, what should you expect? I don't know because they've yeah they've changed what the rules about the ETF are a couple times this week. Um, I would expect it to not necessarily trade in line with oil prices for at least the next several days, um, just because yeah they're yeah they're not pinned to oil prices necessarily, and I think the uh, some of the ETF plumbing there also may have gotten a little broken. Um, All right, here's a good question. What do I think of investing in airlines and retailers long-term? Macy's and Delta to be exact. So I mean, conceptually airlines and retail are gonna be around for a while. I don't think those are going to go away, um, right? People are still gonna buy things. People are still gonna fly on airplanes. Um, Macy's, I think you're probably, yeah. I don't have anything really good to say about Macy's. Um, Macy's the store is fine. I enjoy the parade, uh, but that business model of like having a big store in a mall, I think is, yeah, I think it was on the way out before this crisis happened and I don't think this is going to help. Um, 
Delta, I think. And yeah, and I don't think anybody's going to come bail out in Macy's, right? Nobody did it for Sears or JCPenney or uh, Montgomery Wards. Um, yeah, pick one. Uh, yeah, the mall retailers aren't getting bailed out and some of them may hang on in some form or another, but I don't know what exactly that looks like. Um, Delta is a giant legacy air carrier. Uh, they're going to get money from the federal government. Um, you can, yeah, there seems to be some disagreements in economist circles about whether or not they should get money from the government or, you know, they have assets, they could certainly go through a bankruptcy process um, and some functioning airline would emerge from the other side of that. Um, the reasons to bail them out uh, really revolve around workers don't tend to come out of uh, airline bankruptcies doing particularly well. So you bail them out and it's good for workers. And if you're trying to support workers, that makes sense. Um, so I think Delta probably is a better investment here than Macy's. Um, but I, yeah, I would have told you that in December too, before anybody had heard of the coronavirus. So I don't, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just down on the mall retailers generally. Um, I don't, I don't see that being a successful business going forward. And I haven't seen an effort from Macy's or really anyone else to pivot. Um, oh, here's a good question. How do you explain the drop in Netflix today after the earnings report from yesterday? So, I mean, by all indications, their earnings were somewhat better than expected. Um, you know, they had a lot of subscriber ads, things like that. Um, I think the problem, I think the, the things that Netflix, where Netflix gave people cause to worry is about the future. Um, Netflix has one of the smaller uh, back catalogs, if you will, of content in terms of major streaming services. Now that Disney Plus exists and HBO Max, um, those guys have years worth of content that they own, um, whereas Netflix has to either make new content and they've, you know, they've been doing it over the last five years or so, um, but they certainly don't have the back catalog of say Disney. Um, or HBO for that matter, um, which means they have to rent content, right? That's why things come and go from Netflix as they make deals with a content owner to put it on for a while. And the problem there is if Netflix starts making a ton of money, content owners say, well, give us more of that money and then Netflix's margins go back down. Um, so Netflix wants to make their own content. And right now production of, yeah, guess what? You can't make a TV show right now. Uh, production of everything is shut down. Um, and so I think what the subscription rates to Netflix look like long term after everybody's watched their original content is maybe a little bit uncertain. I think that's probably why the stock is down today. Um, that's that's what I would worry about with Netflix in the future anyway, is a, a long term shutdown of, um, you know, new TV production makes the stock you know less attractive going forward. All right, so I invested in Carnival Cruise Line. Would I say they're in serious danger of bankruptcy or just hold for the long term? Um, I haven't looked at their balance sheet. I think Carnival did go to the capital markets, though. They sold some stock. They sold some bonds. They raised cash in any case. Um, how long that will last them, I'm not sure. Um, their costs are probably pretty low right now. I mean, they have debt payments to make and some basic expenses to cover, but they're not necessarily paying a lot for, um, yeah, I don't think they're paying a, a yeah, their expenses have also lessened, let's say. Um, I don't expect, yeah, Carnival may get bailed out, they may not, I don't know, I feel like it's a much harder sell to bail out Carnival than, say, Delta, just because Delta has a lot more U.S. employees. They own assets in the U.S. Um, all the cruise ships are famously flagged in Panama or somewhere like that uh, because cruise lines don't have to pay taxes on them. Lots and lots of cruise ship crews are made up of foreign nationals because they're cheaper. Um, so the the case for bailing out carnivals makes a lot less sense because 
yeah, you bail out Carnival so they can pay taxes to Panama and pay crews who aren't um, U.S. citizens. I have a hard, I have a hard time, you know, I feel like uh, justifying that to the taxpayer, um, which is not to say it won't happen. It's just I feel like a harder lift politically. Uh, Bill, what do you think of Tesla, especially considering cheap gas? Um, I don't think Tesla was ever really a gas price play. Uh, even the even their cheap car, right? The model, whichever one is the cheap one, I forget. It's like thirty five thousand dollars, which is not right. That's not a budget automobile. Um, I think I don't think people were buying Teslas because gas was expensive. Um, I think yeah, I think the person who would have bought a Hummer and then gas was expensive you know, maybe they bought an F-150 or something. I don't think they went and bought a Tesla. I don't think that was ever really the selling point of a Tesla. I think it's more, um, yeah, it's more, it's more about, you know, how much you want to burn carbon um, versus electricity. I don't think it really ever made sense on a, uh, you know, if you, if you're really budget conscious, I, I don't think it, it made sense that way. Um, so I don't know that cheap gas has much uh, difference in terms of Tesla. All right, so some investors believe the rally since March is based almost entirely on the stimulus package. Given the decline in economic activity across the board, do you think this rally can su sustain itself? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I kind of suggested earlier, I think stocks might be a little overpriced here. Uh, you know, I mean, the PE ratio is higher than it was before the decline. Um, and the earnings outlook is worse than it was before the decline. Uh, I feel like one of those things needs to change. Um, right. Either, either price is too high or expectations are too low. Um, I don't know that it's the stimulus package that led to the bounce so much as the Fed. Uh, I mean, the Fed really came in in unprecedented ways and said, we will not have a credit crisis here, um, which I think was big given that the last economic crisis was a credit crisis and that didn't work out well and the Fed wasn't as aggressive in that case. Um, I think that was really reassuring to a lot of people. Um, but fundamentally, we live in a consumer-driven economy, and if all the consumers are at home not spending money, um, at some point, yeah, at some point, the economy is made up of economic activity, and if people aren't spending money, um, it's going to be an interesting issue. So I'm, I'm interested to see if the rally can sustain itself. Um, valuations start to look a little stretched if the earnings estimates are right. Um, and so, yeah, one one of those is right. It's either the valuation is is you know the valuation is right or the estimates are right. I, I don't really see a case where both of those are right, though. Yeah. So David says, do I recommend taking profits and selling Shopify? I mean. Without knowing your cost basis or anything else, um, certainly if I was holding that and it was up $200 year to date, I'd consider taking some of those profits. Um, So let's see, what do you think of Invax with what's happening with all this competition for the COVID-19? Um, I mean, there's a race on to try to develop a vaccine for COVID-19. Certainly somebody who wins that race has the chance of making a lot of money. Um, it's also possible there'll be multiple success. Yeah, so the possibilities are there's only one winner. Um, that's a huge boon to that company. Um, 
multiple winners, right? Like more than one company could could develop a, a working vaccine. Um, and it, there are also viruses that don't have a vaccine, right? Um, they've been working on a vaccine for HIV for like 30 years and don't have it yet. Um, I did, yeah. I'm not a virologist. I couldn't possibly begin to tell you uh, what the likelihood of somebody develop, developing a vaccine for this are. Um, but uh, picking an individual company, I have no ability to do. Um, all right. So Marty says, I thought you generally look for a five point difference on a vertical spread. Lately, you've recommended spreads with one or two points difference. Can you explain? Um, yeah, so we don't do spreads that are wider than five bucks. Uh, so it's usually five or less. Um, but if I can get one or two, um, you know, that's it's less at risk. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't see much of a reason not to do one or two. Um, a lot of times the, the percent returns are higher in those cases. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the explanation is sometimes one or two is a better trade than five, um, especially with stocks. Yeah, with stocks as low as they are now and volatility as high as they are. Um, why would you put 400 bucks at risk when you can put 200? Um, yeah. Uh, Denikar says there's an archive of your answers to subscriber questions from previous workshops. We don't currently have a good archive. Um, we do have all the recordings. They're on the website, but they're not as easy to navigate as we would like. Um, but we are working on trying to find a way to do that. We definitely don't have an archive of just the question. All right, so Anand says, I just joined the webinar and I'm a young investor. I know that bear markets can be a very good time to invest. What are some stocks, ETFs, mutual funds that you recommend that I buy? Um, I mean, if you're just getting into the market and looking to invest for the long term, like buy a broad-based ET index fund that has, a, yeah, the lowest fees you can find. Um, right, an S&P 500 fund is an S&P 500 fund. It's going to hold a... Yeah, guess what? It's going to have the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 uh, in market cap order in terms of how they're distributed. Um, so at that point, you're going to get the, the same return. The only difference in return among those funds is going to be the fees. Um, so you find the one with the lowest fee and uh, and do that. Um, you know, if you're interested in trading, it depends on sort of, you know, what your time frames are and horizons. Um, but we certainly have tools that can help you with that. But yeah, if you're just getting started and just want to stick some money in a retirement fund and don't know what to do with it, um, it's really hard to go wrong with a, uh, a you know, broad-based index fund. Uh, so Akram has a question about the long end of the PNC diagonal spread. That's that's one where we're probably going to end up taking a loss, uh, to be frank. Um, it's pretty far underwater there. Um, and yeah, there's there's no real hedge I can put on there. Is um, yeah, there's no there's no hedge I can put on there that isn't just going to lose right lose dollar for dollar money if this goes back up. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, but that's sort of where it is right now. Um, all right, I think we're to about the end of the questions. There are a couple questions that I will try to follow up. Um, try to follow up on by email. Um, you know, I'll, I'll save the questions and follow up with some of these by email. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for submitting all the questions. Um, if you have questions about Investors Observer between now and three weeks from now when we do the next one of these, by all means, hit this help button on the website. It sends us an email. Um, I respond to a bunch of them. Uh, you know, some of our other people respond to some of them, but we get back to you pretty fast. Um, we also are working from home, but our office phone has been redirected to several of our houses. So you can also call us on the phone uh, during East Coast business hours, um, eight to five. And we will, uh, you know, we can talk to you and help you out there. 
Uh, so that's it for me today. Uh, this has been recorded. We'll put it up on the website tomorrow and uh, send a recording to everyone along with a copy of the slides. Thank you all for coming and uh, try to wash your hands. Thanks.